argument is either a bad thing or a good thing. And we're not talking about the arguments of two people fighting each other. We're talking about what makes a logical argument today. What makes, uh, you know, you have a position. How do you defend that position? Um, we're going to be talking about that today and maybe a couple episodes, Dan. I, I'm, I'm Ben. You're Dan. We are the teaching pastors at Life Fellowship here outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. And Dan, this was your idea to do an episode on what makes a good argument. And I would love to hear why you why this was something that was stirring in your heart to want to do this. Yeah. I mean, my personality is such I I'm still like to argue. <laughs> I, I, I prefer to put it in nicer terms. I like a spirited conversation. Oh, very, very I, nice. I enjoy pushback, intellectual yep. pushback. It helps yeah. me learn. Yeah. To me, it's like exercise. Yeah. You know, you've got to have resistance training. You've got to yeah. be pushing some weights. So, um, and I tend to express myself with a lot of clarity because, again, that's part of my background, my childhood, my wiring, my Midwestern-isms. Mm. But um, I have no problem with you saying, yeah, I see it another way. And if you say that to me, I'll, I'll lean forward and I'll say, really? What, what, how? Can, give it to me. I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm interested. And I genuinely am. It's not an act. And and like everybody but, but, but else, I, I'm going to want to persuade you that I am right and you're I, wrong. But, can I stop you right there? Mm -hmm. Because I think that you are in the minority of that. Most people oh, don't so, have yeah. that sense of like oh let's talk about it why do why do you lean into it as opposed to most people getting defensive and be like well you're just stupid like well <laughs> part of it is because i'm absolutely convinced in my mind of my rightness most of the time and i think i can persuade you uh. now uh, people that try to do that with personality are called wooers mm -hmm. but teachers try to do it with facts yeah and yeah. i'm by my very nature a teacher and also the academic world prepares you for this mm. so in an academic setting you propose a thesis and then you publish it mm -hmm. and then it is the job of everybody in the room or anybody interested in your topic to beat the tar out of it mm. to find the fallacies to find the the broken uh, research uh, and and to to poke holes to poke see, holes yeah, in it yeah. and what survives is considered valid mm -hmm. if the whole thing survives it's considered a watershed movement or water a watershed uh research mm. and then people cite it for years and years but that's why you publish your work first, and then you present it at a symposium or a congress of some kind, and then people can challenge you and question you, and then you you write another edited version of it, and that's published again, and then often then it's cited by scholars. So I, I lean into that a little bit. And by the way, that's true in theology schools as much as it is. Oh, yeah. in, you know, the Evangelical Theological Society does this every single year. Yep. They have a journal they publish. Yep. So it's it's not it's not something for just eggheads. But it is where the, when you do research and you type in a Google question, this is what comes up that gives some support for the, your, your thesis. And so it, it moves thought along a stream, what they call a stream of knowledge, mm -hmm. moves it forward because you do debate it. So, so for the average everyday person out there that's just on Facebook, yeah. how, why is this applicable? Because I think, and what we're going to be talking about are the flaws of how we debate and how we mm -hmm. argue mm -hmm. that first of all for someone who does know about debate um you're going to get dismissed pretty quickly if you blatantly use these tactics mm. um, and what these tactics do is they create a circular reasoning that eventually drills itself into the ground and at some point somebody who's really interested in intellectual give and take they walk away and say oh well you're not really serious about this so you wouldn't mm. be using these arguments yeah i think also just from my obviously we're in election season and we're going to hear a lot of debate and arguments mm -hmm. of mm -hmm all around these candidates of why you should vote for them, why you shouldn't vote for them. And and I think it's it's helpful for us to be able to to diagnose these kinds of, you know, thoughts and and framework of, of thought that's really important. Yeah. And the way we we work toward resolution when you have two opposing opinions, you know, and Hegel was big about the thesis, antithesis and so forth. But when when you study it from a philosophical, psychological level, whether you're fighting with your wife or you're debating a guy at work, <laughs> or you're listening to your favorite newscast. Uh, you know, there's two issues. Is yeah. One is being able to present and reach a, uh, your, your information, your thesis, and then draw a good conclusion. Um, but the other is being able to have critical thinking. Mm. So we'll actually do an episode on attributes of critical thinking after we do this one, which is basically flaws of, that most people make when they're arguing. And by the way, even intellectual scholars we all, and I'm not saying I'm one of those, by the way, but anybody enjoys this. We we do these things. We oh, slip the, into yes. them. There are default settings. They, I it's very easy to get into. So I remember 
uh, having to read a book by, uh, it was called Attacking Faulty Reasoning by Damer. His last name was D-A-M-E-R. And it was in our Theology 2 class. And I just remember our professor making us read this book by the secular professor. And I'm like, why are we reading this? I want to learn about the Bible. And this is stupid. And he was just like, if you don't learn how to how to make a good, you know, look at flaws and arguments. He's like, you're going to go out there one day and uh, tell people about Jesus. And you're like, why should I believe in Jesus? Because he rose from the dead. I don't, I don't believe he rose from the dead. But the Bible says so. Mm-hmm. I don't believe in the Bible. Well, you should. Then you're a stupid thing. <laughs> you're stupid. <laughs> so it's like, okay, well. Speaking of circular reasons. Yes. Yeah. So, so there, I'm not, and I'm not saying but the Christian faith is unreasonable. I'm just saying is the typical reasons why we present our, our case is not, it's, it's, it's reason, it's, there's some flaws sometimes if we just base our, our, our tiny little, it works within our own little subculture, but it doesn't work outside where they don't have the same philosophical understanding that we do right so all right right. so dan tell us all right so let me just whip through these as quickly as i can the first one is ad hominem okay and so ad hominem is when you attack the person rather than the argument Mm. so that's when you do start calling names or you insult their intelligence or you say well if you'd gone to a real school or if you you know if you weren't blonde or you know if you weren't american or if you weren't a white male or you know but they they begin attacking the personhood of the yeah. person rather than than the idea the ideas at yeah. hand the second thing is the straw man argument and that's when you misrepresent or you can oversimplify or overrepresent in some ways uh, an opponent's position to make it easier and often it follows this so what you're really saying is <laughs> well no <laughs> um, because what you do is you it, it creates what we call a straw man Argument, and it came from the idea that sometimes in in uh, medieval days when they were fighting, they would they would make like scarecrows that made their army look bigger, but they weren't real. They weren't going to fight you, mm. but it was distracting because it looked like you were twice as powerful as you really mm. were, mm-hmm. and and so a straw man argument is basically using an exaggeration or something that's not valid or real to make you appear bigger or smarter or the point more valid than mm-hmm. you really are. Okay. And it's a false narrative. And it really, it really, again, once again, it avoids dealing with the real issues. So when you're debating something like this, you keep having to go back, no, 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 this is what I really said. This is what the point is. Yeah. And you keep having to bring them back to that. Even when you're, you know, fussing with your wife, a lot of times, all of a sudden we start pulling up. Oh, when, when we first got married, you did this. And I, well, I remember one time you said this. No, no, that's not the point. Yeah. All right. So let's not get distracted on that straw man or that old thing. Let's stick to the the issue. Number three is the red herring. And this is when you bring completely irrelevant information or some distracting thing that diverts attention. Sometimes we do this so that we can think more. <laughs> so, you know, I don't have my thoughts all quite lined out. So let me let me throw uh, uh, what they call a red herring because herring are not naturally red. So when you see a red herring, uh, oh, what, what is that? Let me flick. And, mm. and you forget about it. you're there to fish. Mm. So the, you know. So again technique it, it it distracts from the core discussion mm. so now here's here, the next one is a big one and um and this is called the false dichotomy so okay. d- die meaning two is is a choice between two things so you either have a or b it's either black or white it's either up or down and you say that's the only solution mm. and you've called me on this before because mm-hmm. you know we're debating or talking and i tend to see things black or white and white yeah and you'll say but dan you know there is such a thing as gray (laughs) and as soon as you say that to me it flusters me because i know you're right yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) and 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 so but that's important because there's often more than two choices Mm. and and even sometimes when i'm trying to explain this while i'm preaching you've heard me say this is not an either or situation Mm. it can be a both and situation or there may be a solution that's not even on the table it's not just these two it's one we've not even thought of yet so why are we so hung up and dogmatic on on these now here's where it gets hard for christians because we believe either god's word is true or not you yes, know. and and, the, and let's just uh, there is such a thing as black and white righteousness unrighteous. We're, right. we're not right. saying there is gray in morality. Right. Just, just, let's That's just right. all agree upon right. that, right? There, we're not saying that there are no relative truths. There are only absolute exactly. truths. Exactly. So and 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 again, though, part of what we have to be careful is that we're not defining as a truth what is simply an opinion, mm-hmm. yeah, or an application. And it's very easy to do because we want to be right. Yeah, it does go back to pride. A yeah. lot we of always times. think we're right. Like we, we do. just like yeah. we're right well, on well, our heads the whole time. Right. Like I remember, did you ever watch the movie Lincoln? 
mm-hmm. with with Daniel Day Lewis. Oh yeah, the more recent one. Yeah, yeah. There, there's this really popular scene in the movie where he's talking to uh, uh, is it um, Tommy Lee Jones, who's playing this you know radical Republican, and he's trying to rant. One of the best actors in all time is Tommy yeah. Lee Jones. Okay. Yes. Anyways, <laughs> so Lincoln is trying to get this amendment passed, and Tommy Lee Jones is like, "We want." We want all of it. We want all, you know, voting rights. We want all of this. And he's just like, he's like, you know, what's the fastest way to get to to this point point over here? You you got to wind your way through it. If you just kind of, you know, blaze, you know, just point to point B, short short distance. He's like, you're gonna lose people, and you're ne- you're never gonna get there. Right. So just just take these small little side steps to eventually we'll get there. But you have to, you can't be so so idealistic that's like, well, it's either this or nothing. Yeah, and see, that's really important. Uh, based on our last conversation where we were discussing the pragmatism of politics. Yeah. Pragmatism is not always wrong. All of us are pragmatic. At some level. At some level. <clears throat> at some level, if pragmatism If you've got four kids part. in a minivan, you bought that not because of the stylish <laughs> looks of your minivan. You bought it because you have four kids. It was a pragmatic choice. Absolutely. All right. But uh, on, so I, I've often said this for years. Pragmatism is the lifeblood of politics, mm. but it is the death blow to sound theology Mm. so when it comes to who god is that never changes he's immutable that's one of the characteristics of god so it's really important that we know what things on which to be dogmatic Mm. what things in which to you know to now all the attributes of god and how we comprehend god um we will never capture all of that we'll never capture all the truths there are and so we have to be gracious in our exploration but when you say well you know god is the author of evil or you put something characteristically ungodlike on him then you know you've crossed that line mm-hmm. it's no longer pragmatic this is mm-hmm. a violation of truth mm-hmm. so uh, you know that's that's where the false dichotomy we've got it we've got to call them out for what they are and this is when people think that this is when they're playing chess so when you're playing chess, that last move, you know, you, you think you've got him. So what do you say? Check. But until you look at every different possible and you lay your king over, then you get checkmate. Mm. And so we're constantly playing a game of verbal chess and we're like, check, check. Or we're playing the long term. We're going to get you into this corner. And then we're going to say check. But the game isn't over until you say checkmate. Mm. And sometimes you have you have one more move in you. You've got mm-hmm. another option that you can take. So that's why false dichotomies are particularly, I think, dangerous. Another one, and this one is very common in this culture, in this generation, and that is simply an over-appeal to emotion. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, We're, th- this really is probably, is really, really I mean, and, and all sides, we use emotion to get people to, to yeah, buy in. Yeah, and, and And because we're fundamentally intellectual creatures with emotions. Yeah. Or some cases where emotional creatures yeah, with intellect. Too. <laughs> some would argue that. Yeah. 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 And, and and then that, by the way, was a false dichotomy because we're far more complex than just That's emotions exactly. and, and, yeah. and, oh, and nice. the intellect. But um, because we're also philosophy and we're, we're, we're a whole bunch of other things. But in, in the end, um, this is really a tough one because you can either come across so coldly intellectual that you have no heart, no feeling, no compassion, and who wants to be around somebody like that? Then you're just a beast. You're mm. you're a machine. You're an animal. Or you become so driven by your feelings that it's like, you know, holding, a you know, 20 puppies in your hands. They're all squiggling and they're all cute. They're all adorable, but then they're falling on mm. the floor and mm-hmm. dying. So you've, <laughs> that was a weird illustration, wasn't it? But the, the bottom line is you've got to be able to balance between your intellect and your feelings. And, you know, a lot of us who tend to think on a moral intellectual level will say, well, the facts don't give a you-know-what about your feelings. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's fun to say that. That's really like, mm-hmm. that sounds authoritative. It also makes you sound like a big giant jerk mm-hmm. when you yeah. say things like that. Because we are feeling people. Uh, uh, perhaps, and in, in, uh, this is where I'm going to invite our, our producer and, and dear friend Josh to say this. I don't know of any area where this is more of a common issue than in the issue of abortion. Mm. Because you can really pull at heartstrings. Yeah. Both yeah. sides. Yes. Both sides. Both sides. Do you, okay, this is a child who feels pain and recoils in it. And you're basically saying, okay, we can take, we can move in with a knife and basically chop it into little pieces and then reassemble it in a bowl. That is graphic and it causes feelings. It causes a raw spike in emotion 
at every level. It's unavoidable. At the same time, we can also say what you're saying basically that as a woman who was raped or a woman whose father or stepfather slipped into her bed at night and molested her and is now pregnant, no choice of hers, that she must not only go through the physical demands of a nine-month pregnancy, but responsible be responsible for that child potentially Mm -hmm. for the rest of its life, and that's not a problem for you? Yeah. And and, and then Mm -hmm. you just look like the meanest you-know-whatever. Yeah. This is why, like, there's a whole part of our seminar on just how do you balance truth and compassion on on especially that topic. There's other topics like that, like 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 poverty that that, that comes up too. But it's like you as the pro lifer can't just assume that they un, that they know that you believe that rape is a terrible thing, like. Obviously, they should. You would think that we would all just like have at least that much common ground, but especially if you're a pro-life guy. No, that's not the case. So I spend like a minute just talking authentically about how rape is a horrible thing. How this is a terrible, this is one of the worst things that, 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 that humans can do to each other. And our society has problems and our legal system has problems. And if she gets pregnant, then she's got all these, this is a really difficult system for her. But then I end by saying, but part of the reason why I'm against rape is because it's an act of violence against an innocent person. Mm. The reason why I'm against abortion is, is because it's an act of violence against an innocent person. So they're, so they're related for me. And in that way, we can balance showing we really, really <laughs> care. I really care about her. And then here's And you the have something in common on which to continue your yes. dialogue. Yes. See, that's brilliant. And that's why Josh is one of the best debaters in the country on this topic. Because mm. you but you have to be thoughtful. Yeah. You had to have had a bunch of arguments oh, where yeah. it went off the rails. So behind the scenes, my brother and I went through like eight different typical pro-life responses to that thing and and poking holes in all of them until we ended up with that one last mm. sound bite. That was the only one that we could find that didn't have problems. So yeah, there's a whole process that goes through of kind yeah. of sharpening. And that's why debate is truly a science. It's yeah. an art, but it's also a science. Yeah. You better know what you're doing. Yeah. Okay, so the next one to get through them all in, in, in the session is overgeneralization. So overgeneralization are these wide sweeping statements that you we, always, you yeah, never, you, you never, you always. By the way, and <laughs> those are, are always st- making those over. over <laughs> those are the those worst. Those are so unproductive in a, in a marriage. I was going to say when I do marriage mm-hmm. counseling or any kind of counseling, it's like when, just never use always and never yeah. because mm-hmm. always and never instantly makes the other person defensive. Yep, yep. and and you're not. You're not coming together. You can't and dialogue. And it's never true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. The conclusions are never supported by the data. Yeah, it just yeah. It, it just isn't. Yeah. It's either it's either it's anecdotal. Oh, yeah, it's, it's anecdotal oh, yeah. because it happened to you once. We assume it could happen to everybody. Yeah. Um, so empirical says no. It's been tested by research. It's you know mm. 99 times out of 100 you get this this result. Yeah. So, okay. Um, the other one, and this is a big one, and and Josh, I expect to hear from you on this one again. It's confirmation bias. Yeah. So confirmation bias is that we don't e- we're not even aware that we're this way. And yeah. this is where it's important to know this is a thing because if you don't know it's a thing, you won't even know that you do it. But it's you sit down and these people are going to agree with you up front and therefore you give them twice the credibility, a tenth the scrutiny and you you you're you're affirming what they're they're saying before they even say it because you trust them. So so can I can I ask you something about that? No, no, you can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Not on this podcast. What do you do with a young person who might be fragile in their faith and they're trying to figure out the arguments of agnosticism, atheism, and Christianity? And like, at what point do you want to help them firm up their faith and try to read Case for Christ, 12 points that prove Christianity is true Frank by Frank Turk and Norman Geisler, as opposed to like, here's the, you know, the God delusion. Read that. Like, there's been a lot of people that have... That have like delved deep into the realm of agnostic atheism, and all of a sudden it, they they have a faith, you know, crisis mm-hmm. of their faith. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What what so would do you, you teach? Say, three, do you teach three year olds um, arithmetic? No, do you? Te- well, that's true. <laughs> but do you teach three year olds the facts of life? No, no. You may tell them body part names, but you don't tell yeah. them fact. They're not ready for it. Yeah. I think it's really important. You know, when I when I was teaching seniors in college, so these were people mm-hmm. getting ready to get their bachelor's degree. And I taught a course on worldview and, and philosophy, and I did have them read the God Delusion. Mm. Nice. And they had to they they had to read ten sources, and they could have up to three that. And and I actively did the four horses of the atheistic uh, apocalypse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so they could pick two or three of those, but they had. 
they had to read more from a biblical worldview than they did from that worldview, but I wanted them to be able to answer it. And it was was a test for me because if they collapsed under that, then I hadn't done my job either. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I just just wanted to, because the confirmation bias can sometimes be, uh, you know, abused in a way that's sure. like no no you, yeah. you, th- th- you but want it's, it's never too young to teach for kids to think critically though i agree that, that is so, I, so I, that's like, a look, great point let's look at at, at both sides or let, 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 let's get into a practice of of here's this thing that someone that we like said like what do we think about that yeah, or, or yeah. like yeah that's yeah good. and you see that's where uh, the critical thinking episode which we'll get into you know the next one of the next few times is, is so essential because often the other side doesn't want you to think critically that's right. Because yeah. it's it's lazy. Oh it, yeah, it's easier I, not to. Yeah, I mean mo- most most podcasts, television shows, YouTube's. It's like they just they they present something that makes you, you one of these. I'm pulling at your emotional heartstrings, or you know, straw man argument of something. And you're just like, well, yeah, I can't even. You know, what am I supposed to say about yeah. that? And yeah. Because we live in a world of ninety second clips now, and yeah. that is. Not, that's not conducive to an argument. Yeah, and, and it's one of the reasons why I say it's good to watch, you know, particularly for politics and government issues, the other side. For years, I listened to PBS, or um, NPR, rather, NPR, um, because it always presented the other side. Sometimes I'd want to drive my car into a tree <laughs> because the arguments were so horrible. But, it, it, you know, I, I regularly visit CNN's website. I yeah. regularly yeah. listen to ABC News at night yeah. because... I want to know what they think I think. Mm. I want them to know. Um, I, I want to know so that I can debate them better. Yeah. Got to hurry. Number eight is equivocation. So equivocation, politicians are experts at this. Mm-hmm. It's so that if you push them up against it, you say, well, you said this. Well, that's not what I meant. So in other words, they give themselves verbal wiggle room to change change the conclusion that you're trying to draw for so them. real quick just to define it equivocation mm-hmm. is where the two people in the debate are using the same word but they're defining them differently yeah. they're using differently yeah. husbands and wives do this all the time too like we like we just miss each other yeah. accidentally. So, and we and often we use intentionally ambiguous terms mm-hmm. so that we have that wiggle room yes all right slippery slope argument uh this argues that if you take this step You'll eventually lean, <laughs> yeah. lean, find yourself at the we're bottom of the hill. We're going to put drums on the mess. stage, and next thing you know, yeah, we're, we're going to have strippers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've literally had that one no, used, I, by I the way. I know. <laughs> really? That's the, oh, yeah. yeah. I it's, had it's, that one. Yeah, you have praise singers, uh, you have praise singers holding microphones uh, on the platform. It's, it reminds me of going to a strip bar, which, to which my reply was, I've never been to a strip bar. Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> I, literally, I mean, this is an actual conversation. I've been around the worst of worst my entire oh, life. I've literally man. never had that yeah, thought or yeah. heard that one. Okay. So, so in other words, it assumes causation without proof. Yeah. yeah. All right. Number 10, circular reason. We've already kind of hit that one, but that's when the conclusion is included in the premise of the argument. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, so, so basically you just spin yourself in circle because you just assume that everything you've said is true, including the, and you've, you've already told them what you believe and why that's true. And you just keep going back and forth around that. And then the last thing is ignoring the burden of proof. So when we fail to provide evidence to support our claim, mm-hmm. or when we cite irreliable, unreliable sources, mm-hmm. then we ignore the burden of proof. So if you don't believe that an election was legal, or if you believe it was stolen, but you don't have empirical proof, not anecdotal, empirical proof, actual evidence, which was part of the problem with the election. You know, Trump spent a half a billion dollars trying to prove that the election was stolen, and yet not one single court. Mm -hmm. But yet, many of them still believe the election was stolen in spite of, and that's confirmation bias, by the way, Mm -hmm. and and, and several other things here. But but, um, when we don't get the right outcome, and we assume, um, you know, because of that, we will believe anything mm. to, to be able to continue believing what we believe, mm. then we've ignored the burden of proof. Yeah. So the burden of proof comes down to us. Can you can you back up what you say? Yeah. With, with reliable evidence. That's so, good. So those those are real quick as a high I know, review. I books have, have been so written on questions, this. Dan. Uh, All right. right so you got more. you got through that. Let's just next episode, let's kind of dig into those a little bit. And then we can kind of go to your second part. Does that sound good? Sounds like a plan. Awesome. Nice. All right. Thank you uh, for joining us here on Life Talks. We want to help you think. We want to help you believe. We want to help you live in a way that honors and pleases Christ with your life. And so I hope that this has been a uh, a challenging episode for you to, to make sure that you are thinking critically in your own life and look at the arguments you're, you're using in your own social media or relationship world um, and make sure that we are following Christ and doing it in a way that honors him. So thanks again for joining us on Life Talks. We'll talk to you next time.